2020 has been a uh, it's been a mixed bag really it's been it's been fantastic in some ways and shit in the others uh, the main one being i had uh, i got covid in um february i went to carp italy with sonic and vital baits and uh I was on the stand with all the Italians and I flew of all places to Bergamo, which was the epicentre of the whole of the COVID thing where it started. And there was only probably a couple of hundred cases in uh, the whole of Italy when, when I went, but it was right there. And then we went to Parma to the show, stayed in a hotel. One of the vital team was a, a big fat Italian guy that looked like Pavarotti. And uh, he was hacking and coughing everywhere. And I thought, oh well, shit, he's got, he's got this COVID in. Uh, we were right in close proximity and I was worried about it. So I said, what do you do for a job? And he said, oh, I'm a paramedic. I thought, oh, I'm doomed. So, uh, yeah, there were about 20,000 Italians there all wanting to shake hands with you and give you hugs, you know. Oh, ciao, Franco, and all the rest of it. And uh, I had that Angel, I was washing my hands like a maniac, you know, after shaking hands with them all. But you inevitably breathed in the same space. You know, there's probably several people that had it there. And... Uh, I got home, I did a, did a thing with you, Joe, didn't I? We went on that uh, Drayton winter runs water, doing a bit of casting. Started aching that day, like I'd got serious flu. Then it got worse, then I lost my sense of taste, which was ominous. Uh, then it got much, much worse. Felt like I'd got a little bit of asthma at night, struggling to breathe a bit. Anyway... I was on the point of going to hospital, but they didn't have a unit set up in Manchester. I must have been one of the first cases of it. And uh, so they just said to self-isolate. So I sat in for a couple of three weeks, got rid of that. And I thought I cracked it, no problem. And then uh, a few weeks later, I felt half my body go completely numb. Like I'd had an anaesthetic, started to panic, knew something was going down. I thought it's either a heart attack or a stroke. So my son took me to the hospital did the usual bullshit, made me wait for four hours. You know, with the Inshore Hospital, there was all these psychos in there with axe wounds and fuck knows what else, you know, there was all kinds of carnage going on. So they said, oh, go and wait. And I said, listen, I'm getting paralysed here. They still made me wait. Anyway, I'd had a stroke and uh, I'd had a blood clot that had gone from my lungs or somewhere, gone to my brain, damaged the part of my brain that synthesises all your sense of touch and feel. So it was fairly terrifying, actually, and uh, I managed to get over it and shrug it off. Uh, I'm on medication now. I'm eating careful, can't drink anymore, so which is a bit of a blow. <laughs> so I used to like a whiskey and coke and stuff like that, and the odd pint. Not like a maniac, but, you know, I did enjoy it, so it's all finished. Anyway, I uh, started eating healthier. Um, the medication seems to have settled down now. That was a bit weird to start with. You know, I had sort of moments where I was getting dizzy and everything. So, yeah, it's been a mixed bag, but I, I've rediscovered my love of carp fishing because I did, I did get a bit jaundiced with it, I must admit, where uh, I felt a little bit like... Uh, disenchanted with it, with the commercialism of it and the... Uh, nothing secret anymore it's all on facebook instantly or on instagram and you know you, you can't fart without everyone wanting to hear about it or yeah i don't know it just got me down a bit and i i think it's almost like uh i mean gas Ferry made me laugh recently i seen an interview with him and he, he said carp fishing's all almost become like a, a dick swinging competition you know where it's like your kudos is measured in likes on Instagram or on uh, Facebook or something like that. And it has become a bit like that. And I, I can't give a shit about any of that, if I'm honest. I just go fishing for, for my own enjoyment. I mean, of course, I earn a little bit of a living from fishing. So I have got some companies that I have to sort of play the game with and be be there for them and, you know, represent them and stuff, which, which I take that fully on board. You know, I, I do consider that, but... Uh, at the same time, you know, you don't want to become like a, a media whore, you know, uh, you, your legs are constantly open and that, you know, it's just not my scene, that. So that's the answer to that one. It has been a mixed bag, but uh, I've still got my sense of humour, as you've probably just seen, so that's not so bad.
Uh, well, it depends what you mean by forefront. I mean, it's whether you want to be busy and be in all the media and magazines and uh, whether that equates to success, I don't know. I, I actually don't feel any pressure to do any of this, really. I, I did a little bit kind of vanish where I thought I got a little bit sick of the... Uh, the way it was all going. I, I, I kind of, I felt like, you know, these people that walk around with all these logos on representing companies and, you know, everything's like a, a plug for everything. It just sent me crazy and tipped me over the edge of that. And I, I just couldn't be doing with it. Uh, it's not great if you want to work in the industry, if you're a little bit like that. It's almost like, uh, you know, trying to sell cars and you don't drive. It's a, you know, it's it's a strange thing, but I I don't feel any pressure whatsoever to to have to go out there and prove myself. I mean, I, I like obviously catching big fish like anyone else does, or numbers of fish. But I I, I do entirely what I want to do myself. I don't uh, I don't I see a lot of anglers that are quite well known anglers going on places where you, you know they wouldn't really fish. They're just going on there to do features and to, to, to grind out a result, you know, maybe in winter or something like that. And I, I can't, I'm too long in the tooth. I don't want to be sat somewhere I don't want to go. I find it very difficult to, to not be true to myself. So, uh, uh, and as I say, it doesn't always work with the, the companies that you're associated with because you, you, you have to play the game. So I'm quite contrary. I don't really want to play that game, but I'll do it in my own way, other ways, you know. I mean, with the companies I work for, one of the, the key things I've always had a, a motto has been to not use the word no. If they ask me to do an open day or, you know, a weekend in Italy at a show or whatever it's always a yes so i'll keep people happy generally that way you know i'm quite uh, easy going like that but uh compromising the fishing is not really on the agenda for me i'm not mad on that uh so i mean i'm still thinking and doing a lot of innovating it's just that i've not got a vessel to to bring those things to the forefront apart from the bait situation uh, and with vital baits at the moment, and they 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 they've given me a free reign to do quite a lot of innovation work and stuff. I mean, there's stuff I'd like to bring out that's probably a little bit peculiar. Uh, that's all I can say about that. You know, even they're sort of like, really, you want to do that? And I said, well, yeah, I want to do. I'd love to be able to just tell you right now what I'm thinking about. Uh, but I know it, it's almost like you just give the whole game away and it would be reproduced instantly because uh, it, it's a game changer. Uh, but it's actually getting getting like people like Vital to to take that leap of faith to do it, you know. It's quite... Uh, it's always been the same, really. It's like with rigs in the past or different processes that I've gone through, it's only when someone showed some faith in us, like Dynamite did with the fluoros, and that was nearly 20 years after us using the fluoros, that they actually went back to us, you know. I mean, that's another story. I should have done it myself. But, yeah, there's plenty in the, there's plenty in the tank still, so to speak. No, I... I did think I was easing off a little bit. And like I was saying, I alluded to earlier in that earlier question about the uh, 2020. I, uh, I'm i still mad as hell on the uh, fishing around the world, European fishing in particular. I mean, I, I tend to go for quality rather than quantity. That's my bag. Having said that, it has changed a little bit this year because I've been fishing closer to home. Uh, it's made it easier because I've not got that mental grind and pain in the ass where I'm thinking, ah, oh, shit, I've got to drive at least 300 miles to get to where I'm. And when I get there, it's mobbed, you know. I mean, I love Bluebell Lakes, that complex there. And I've been there several times and it's just, just been no swims on the whole complex, you know. There's probably 200 anglers on there. 
So you're not even looking for the fish, you're just looking for, for somewhere to fish. You know, waiting for someone to pack up and you, you Mallard, the runs water of the complex. You, you're driving around that, uh, which you don't really want to be. You know, I wanted to be on Kingfisher or Swan and you, you've got some guys there. And, oh, all right, mate, I'm packing up in eight hours. You can wait and have this swim if you want. It's just not what you want to be doing after 50 years of carp fishing. You know, it's like pass me the revolver. <laughs> Boom. So I don't want to say, you know, too much about it, apart from the fact that a lot of waters have gone a little bit like that. And I just, I just can't get, get my head around the fact that you, you're no longer fishing how I used to fish, where you find the fish classically, you know, and then get in position and do your thing. It's, it's, it's a different thing. It's become too popular. And uh, so I don't like that part of it, but what I do crave is places where I can move around and look for the fish and... You know, like this place is ace, you know, you come on here and you've got a choice of swims and you're actually looking for where the fish are and if moving and things like that, it's, it's, it should be, out, uh, should be like that. But obviously it's not always. And then that's why I like Euro fishing, you know, you can go on a water and if it's not exactly what you want, there's other waters nearby or you've got a full repertoire of waters to fall back on. And uh, it, it's... It's the purest form of carp fishing. It doesn't matter uh, if anyone thinks, oh, foreign fish are easy, they don't count. And all. I don't buy into that. It's, it's pleasure, it's enjoyment. And I think if you lose sight of the fact that this is meant to be fun, it's not an SAS assault course, you know, where you don't want to miss your life by the same means. Can you imagine that? It's like, I was that obsessed with carp fishing when I was young. I never imagined having children or a normal life or anything. I just wanted to fish all the time and opt out, almost like a hippie opts out of society. I wanted to opt out of normal society and just fish for the rest of my life. And then the realisation hit me. I sat on Reedsmere one time and I was thinking, hang on, all the best years of my life are going to just pass me by. You know, all the going in nightclubs, chatting women up and doing all the great things, going on holiday with all your pals to Ibiza or wherever. I was missing all of that, you know. Yeah, so basically something had to give with me. So I, I decided to have a normal life and have a family and, you know, do normal work and stuff and uh, have the fishing to look forward to, not have the fishing constantly as a oh shit, I've got to go fishing again, you know, because I've got this to do, that to do. I wanted to have that balance where the fishing didn't become a drudgery. It, it was something to look forward to, how, how, how I wanted it. And that's never changed, really. I still like to have that, the magic of the fishing to look forward to. Uh, so I'm not particularly pushing trying to be some superstar in the fishing current sort of, you know, oh, he smashed it up again and all that. I don't really see the need to have to do that. And uh, I must say, as you get older, you don't, you, you, you organically change. You know, it's like, it's like the old bull and the young sort of bull joke. You know, you don't have to do everything instantly. You can slow down and still enjoy it all. And, and that's how I see that, so. I still got a lot to offer though, you know, I think there's, uh, there's there's quite a lot of innovation in me still. I'm still full of ideas. I just need a vehicle to, I mean, I'm not with a terminal tackle company, you know, and I've got so many rig ideas and, you know, bits and pieces that I could offer and innovate. And it's just a shame. It's, it's kind of wasted. It's almost landlocked, you know, and, uh, I mean, I do think outside the box, so some of the stuff I, I, I'm messing with and coming up with is, is definitely very unusual. But that's how these steps happen. That's how it's happened in the past, and it's still there. That doesn't change, you know. So, yeah, I'd still like to do something on that front. Well, the carp fishing scene in the 90s was okay, but I would say the 80s was better because I, I started uh, carp fishing in 1970. I was only a kid, of course, but I'd say the, the real special era for me was the 80s. 
uh, from when when the hair came in to you know doing the single hook baits and the the long range fishing and uh, you know some of the early experiments with the bait were incredible. Um, that was the special period for me, more than the 90s. The 90s was great, but I was fishing more down in uh, Oxford in the 90s. Started fishing a linear, you know, fishing uh, Manor Farm and St. John's and Ardwick. Uh, of course, you know, I started fishing abroad a lot in the uh, early 90s as well. That was the very interesting aspect of that. Late 80s, early 90s. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose the 90s was the era of the uh, ready-made decent baits that you got, you know. In the 80s, we used to primarily make our own boilies and get your own base mixes and then roll your own stuff, you know. There's very few companies that did ready roll boilers. I think that was the biggest change in that period. The sort of main line came to the forefront, that era. People like that. Uh, Richworth were doing it. I think that's what stands out from the 90s. And the fact that uh, a lot of the anglers that were lazy, that never used to make their own bait, that would just struggle along, you know, perhaps using particles or something, it enabled them to sort of get on the on the bandwagon a little bit more than when the companies were doing freezer baits and things, you know, very good baits. I, th I think that was the main game changer in the 90s. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... To me, it was just part of the... Uh, I suppose I was at my most prolific in the, in the 90s, catching-wise, you know, that, that was times when... A, there were certain things I did that that were quite pronounced then. I did the plastic throwing stick, the one that Dan ended up doing with Corda. That was, the metal ones existed. Where I did the first plastic one, because I got a tennis elbow from the uh, the metal one. So I had a fishing tackle shop at the time in 1991. I had tennis elbow, so I, I thought, sod this, I'm going to make my own throwing stick. So I, I made a plastic one from a, a pole tip tidy that we used to keep the quiver tips in. It was transparent with two red caps on the end. So I got an old Cala gas heater. Heated it up, twizzling it round. And it'd suddenly go all floppy, the, uh, the pole tip tidy. I'd bend it like a throwing stick like you've got now. Uh, let it cool off, turning it over so it was true the bend in it. Sawed it off with a hacksaw, bit of tape round the bottom took it out and it was instantly uh, fantastic, you know. So it was just improvisation and ideas like that that kind of took off, you know. I mean, Cora's still doing them to this day. So it's not like where you could just walk, go online and buy everything. You know, there was still a lot of stuff to improvise and to innovate, really. So it was great times in the 90s, yeah. That was just the tip of the iceberg, though, doing all sorts, you know. Yeah, I've, I've recently watched Gaz Fairham doing some podcasts and things. And uh, I remember meeting Gaz when he was a kid, really. He was only about 17 or 18. And uh, it's great to see how he's progressed and how he's come on. And uh, the things he's gone on to do, you know, with the uh, subsurface and his artwork and his writings and stuff. Yeah, it makes me a little bit proud to, to see another kid from up north do well like that, you know, it's, it's nice. Uh, as far as people that impressed me, well, it was my era, you know, I, I came in a little bit after Rod Hutchinson and Kevin Maddox, that sort of period. And in the 70s, you couldn't fail to be impressed by Rod Hutchinson's writings. He was my personal favourite always, you know. I used to love his writings, and he, he, he was, it was a bit of an adventure with, with Rod. He wasn't uh, all prim and proper and methodical and everything was super neat. You know, he, he had loads of accidents. He was very accident prone. Super intelligent as well, Rod. When I spent a lot of time with him, and we, we became very, very good friends. And uh, 
only when you sat with him and you, 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 you know, a lot of people remember Rod for the fact that he liked to get on the piss and he was drinking all the time and, and that kind of clouded his, his life a little bit, unfortunately, but he, he was super smart, quite a shy man, but very, uh, very intelligent, as I say, really good thinker. A lot of his theories and stuff would stand up today, uh, you know, as, uh, Basically, or, or, uh, he was an authority on a lot of his subjects, particularly on the flavours and the, uh, the bait side, ingredients and things. And, uh, you know, he developed the first 12-foot cart rods and 13-foot cart rods. So he was a big influence on my life. And uh, Jim Gibbonson as well. Uh, Jim, some of his early writings were fabulous. You know, he did cart books and stuff. And uh, everything he wrote about made sense you could see he was a, i think he was a school english teacher jim or maybe even a headmaster but you could see it in his writings that he was very organized and methodical you know so i always used to look forward to his stuff and uh i mean there was jack hilton as well and uh peter mohan as well he used to read a lot of his stuff even though it was a little bit uh more of a story type stuff, you know. It, it, it always used to captivate me, some of the uh, his writings. And Kevin Maddox, when Cart Fever came out, that was it, that was a huge influence. And John Baker, who I became very good friends with, he did the bait section in Cart Fever. Uh, that was very... Infer that, that one chapter in Cart Fever about the bait made a huge difference to me, you know, because I... Uh, as I say, there wasn't much information. We didn't have magazines or any of the internet like we had now with YouTube where you can just get on and virtually Google anything. There was, there was nothing like that. So, you know, a lot of it was improvisation or we'd make our own stuff or come up with our own answers. So them, them people were uh, inspirational at the time because they, they were the few voices out there that were actually in the, in the mainstream fishing magazines because a lot of the magazines would be multi-species magazines you know where you'd they'd have articles about bream and tench and uh, pike fishing just a big mixture of stuff uh, and then you get the occasional carp article in there by rod hutchinson or kevin maddox or so on you know and they were the the special things uh so therefore they were the groundbreakers really uh Dick Walker as well, he, I used to read his column in the Angling Times. Uh, I bought the Angling Times for years. So, yeah, he, he was another little inspiration. So, yeah. Um, I don't really... I don't really have targets. I, I always felt that uh, if you if you set yourself up to catch a target fish it kind of ties you there to that water and if you're not enjoying it say you've got a few assholes on the water that you, you're fishing and you've got a target fish that you want to catch and you've got like i don't know just just the wrong type of people on the lake or there's something about it or there's some you're not enjoying it it's it's not aesthetically pleasing to sit on i don't want to sit there i just refuse to need to catch a fish that bad that I'm going to put up with stuff that I don't want. I don't, I've never seen that need to, if they come along when I'm fishing it, that's fine. And you, you in your mind, you're thinking, oh, I want whatever to come along. You know, when I was fishing Manor Farm in the old days, thinking, oh, I want to catch Popeye, which was the biggest fish in there. And any, any water, you're always sort of thinking in the back of your mind, I wouldn't mind that. But unless you're stalking the fish, and you can actually physically see them, so you're hunting that specific target, you're just playing the numbers game. So to me, life's a bit too short to go doing campaign fishing. I've always felt like, if it, you know, it's bound to get caught when you're not there, if you're not on there all the time. So it, it sort of becomes a curse because <clears throat> if you start on somewhere and you want to catch the biggest group of fish in there or, or the biggest fish 
you're on edge all the time thinking when you're not there, thinking, oh, it's going to come out. I mean, I used to be like that on Reedsmere when I was younger. Oh, the male common's going to come out this week when I'm not there. If I go on a family holiday or something, you know, it's so it becomes a little bit of a a ball and chain. So I hate all that nonsense. So I, I, I kind of grew out of it and thought, don't be stupid. It's just a bit of fishing. Just carry on with your, your main fishing. Enjoy it. I like to, I enjoy the big ones when they come. Uh, I don't particularly fish tactics to get more bites. Sometimes I'll fish specifically looking to catch bigger fish. You know, I might not always try and be on the main shoal of fish, you know, moving to do it. Because a lot of the time the big fish will be not traveling with the, the main group of fish. So I kind of got a little bit into that kind of flow. Probably that's my excuse for not moving too much, chasing them, you know. But, uh, yeah, I I just take it as it comes. I mean, I, I like catching the big ones in Europe. So when I'm choosing a venue that I want to focus on, the bigger the better, really. If it's got, like, 80s in it, happy days. You know, that, that kind of floats my boat now, knowing that they're in there. I've not had an 80, by the way, but if the venue... Um, targeting's got them in that makes it perfect and uh why shouldn't you but having said that if it came to choosing a venue that's got 60s in that are absolute stunners you know big plated fish or 80 pounders that are ugly pigs a little bit like them euro aqua fish i'm not saying they're all ugly but they're a little bit bland they're not not heavily scaled you know they're all like big drop guts on them and you know, uh, just bulks, just pigs with fins. I'd go for the scaly ones every time. So, I mean, we all appreciate stunning looking fish. That's how it is really. Uh, and I think that's more of a benchmark to me than pure pounds and ounces. So that's my driver really to get beautiful surroundings with stunning looking fish. And if they happen to be big, perfect. So that's how I see it. Well. I don't know. I mean, I've just had a new benchmark of something that's never happened to me before that I, w I always would have liked. Uh, I've got my own range of Frank Warwick rods with Sonic, which is like always been a little ambition of mine. So I've achieved that. It was their choice, which is very nice of them. Uh, but there's not many people can say that, is there? Really, that they've they've got their own name on a you know on a big company's particular brand of rods. Uh, I can only think of Rod Hutchinson, Kevin Maddox, uh, Jim Gibbonson, uh, Kevin Nash. Uh, but there ain't, too, there ain't too many people out there that's ever managed that. So that's some, something I'm very, very proud of. Uh, personal ambitions. Uh, well, it was, as I said earlier, I had that stroke in the uh, beginning of April and that that was pretty, truly terrifying. So just to get super healthy and get my health back, you know, because you're always scared of having a, a reoccurrence or something like that, even though it was caused by that COVID thing. Once you've had a health issue, it kind of crystallises just how fragile life is, you know, and you, uh, I mean, I want to be around a lot longer yet. So I've been eating well, being very careful with my health and, uh, um, living healthy and I kind of uh, focused on that a lot and uh, I'm, I wanted to write another book that's another important thing to me uh, the other one sold extremely well it's still selling now but I, a lot of people have said they're dying to see me do a, a, nec uh, a next book that's got a very technical side to it and uh, I ain't got many vehicles anymore with a lot of the magazines falling by the wayside. I mean, there's only, there's only total in carpology now, isn't there really, when you think about it? And they've got, those mags tend to have uh, the, the, the current sort of flavor guys in there, you know, that are, that are with all the big companies out there and writing regular and doing stuff and doing lots of blogs and things. So my kind of, People of my era, I suppose, uh, might not always appeal to the younger generation that might not be that familiar with me and my my sort of time, you know. 
suppose everything has its sort of special period in time. So I wouldn't mind a little bit more exposure via... Uh, I'm going to start doing a lot more filming and things. So I, I think I've still got a lot to offer where the younger generations might sort of suddenly go, oh, he's got a little bit to say that they might have not seen before. So I, I plan to do quite a lot on that front. Uh, I'm going to learn how to use a camera and do some of my own work like that as well. I think that's held me back a little bit where I've had things that I've wanted to do and show. Uh, like yesterday I was talking to you, Joe. I wouldn't mind doing a... A lot of people ask me about how I make them single hook baits. And I think it would be pretty super to get all my bait making gear, get all my old additives out and my... Because I still make all the bait myself, my hook baits particularly. I'll always make them. It's no matter what bait company I'm with or anything, I like still messing with my own hook baits. So I want to... Uh, film that from start to finish like an a to z of making your own special hook baits whether they be food baits or higher track singles or something in between and i think there's a there's quite a lot to offer on that front there so i think that'd be a nice thing to do you know so yeah i've got i've got lots of little plans and ambitions to do uh so yeah Oh, there's lots of people I've fished with over the years that have been uh, outstanding, really. A lot of names that you, you might not necessarily know, you know, they're not always got to be in the angling public eye. Um, I think... Uh, as I said, no name bigger, really. It was Rod Hutchinson. I fished with him a bit, and he, he was fabulous. Had some great memories of him. I was fishing with him one time on Gravius, Luke Moffat's place. And I went round and uh, he asked me to nip round for a, a chat and a whiskey. So I, uh, I wound the rods in, went round the other side of the lake. And Rod was pretty well plastered. He'd had a few. And he, uh, he got a bottle of whiskey out. And he was sat in his slippers, roasting red hot it was. No shade. It was absolutely... I was... I looked like Gandhi, I did. I was like really tanned, you know, like an old, like an old red Indian. And uh, he said, oh shit, I've only got one glass. And then he remembered that he'd seen another one that some previous angler had dumped in the nettles and it had spider's webs in it and like shit in the bottom of the glass. He never even washed it. He just gave it a bit of a, got the webs out of it a bit and poured me a big whiskey. It's like something out of the wild west. So I thought, oh, bollocks to it. So I was drinking that with Rod. We're reminiscing and everything, you know. And then he gets a, a slow trundling take that just took off. Obviously a sign of a big fish. Rod got up on wobbly legs, completely missed the rods and went head first into the lake. I, I was in a state of shock for a minute. I thought, I can't believe I've just seen that. A flying head straight in the lake. So he, he was good fun. And... Uh, it didn't just happen once on that trip either. I think he went in a few times. Uh, it was like he was punch drunk, you know, like Mohammed Ali after uh, when he went in in the latter part of his sort of time. And uh, but tremendous, tremendous company. And I mean, there's some stuff I could tell you that that's hilarious, but I don't know whether I should really. That Rod said, "Yeah, I think I should." Should I? Well, he, he told me about. He was one of the very first. Uh, angling celebrities if you like that went to the Czech Republic and it was when it was the old Iron Curtain you know and uh, he went over he said the secret police were following him around <laughs> in case he was a spy <laughs> which made me laugh and he he, uh, he had Mally with him Mally Ro uh, Roberts his sidekick Mal and Rob used to go everywhere together you know in the latter years in particular they're like a, a double act so Mal went with uh, Rod and of all places, he they were treating him like a god over there, you know, because they're mad on carp fishing and that, and they call him Mr. Rod. And they put him in a health farm, which I thought was quite ironic. It was like a sanitarium stroke health farm. And in there, it was to dry out alcoholics and uh, people that were abusing substances. They'd put him in there. And it was the only place in this town that they had that was of really nice quality, you know. It was for quite rich people as well. So Rod got in there and he said, uh, 
me and Mal were on the veranda and he says I'd got a bottle of whiskey and sat with a whiskey in my hand and a big joint in the other. When we got an official visit from the Lord Mayor of the town and all the dignitaries, including some people that were obviously secret police that were part of the entourage, and they went, oh, uh, Mr. Rod, you shouldn't really be allowed to smoke in here, uh, but because it's you, it's okay. So we carried on smoking the joint, he was saying, and drinking the whiskey in the health farm. And on the, he thought the, the, the Lord Mayor of the town obviously got into the theme a little bit, so he said, Mr. Rod, he said, uh, would you like any woman's? And Rod said, uh, what do you mean like? He said, well, we can provide women's. You can have what you want. He says, what age women do you like, Rod? And he went, well, 20, 25 to 35. He went, oh, you like the old ones. <laughs> so uh, I cracked up laughing when Rod told me that, you know. He never told me whether he went for the challenge or not. I, I suspect he didn't. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so Rod was hilarious and very funny. And uh, I remember when I fished Savvy in the, about 83 I went down fishing Savvy and, and my old, uh, like I had a, a sort of Cosworth body shell with a, just a 1600 engine and it wasn't very clever and it was forever breaking down. So I went down there, ventured down to Savvy, about 83, just fishing on a day ticket. And I met all the, obviously read Malin's books about the, the toad and loony rotors. I ended up, getting pally with all the toad rotor and the loony rotor in particular the loonies were more my style so i met martin lock there and uh, steve olcott who i already knew uh, and trotter and uh, roger smith kerry barringer bob jones oh I met, I met them all and we had some tremendous times they they were great characters mailing of course as well and uh yeah we used to go nightclubbing and everything while, while we were fishing, which was quite unusual. Uh, so yeah, I had some good times with them. And uh, obviously, Crowey, uh, I've got fond memories of fishing with uh, Simon Crow, a very, very good friend of mine in Reduta in the early days. Uh, oh, we had some laughs, great stuff, you know. So, uh, Crowey has become an awesome angler as well, you know. he's. Uh, he was always a good angler, but I think he's really coming to his own now, you know. I think he got all the information from working for Carp Talk for all them years and, you know, the network of captures and the people that he got to know on that. And he's, his knowledge of all the waters in the UK and on the continent is immense and his connections. And he, he's... Uh, He's 100% for long crow, he's a trier, you know, he's nothing's too much trouble. If he, if he had to move 10 times, he would move 10 times on a session. Uh, he's always been like that and uh, a proper gent as well. I, I, yeah, I'm very fond of Crowy, and I think it's good to see him doing well, you know, I like that. Uh, so he was always good. Martin Bowler was another one. Uh, Martin always used to say, ah, I've caught one of them silly old carp, you know. And he used to play it down, the, the, the carp angler in him because he's such a good all-rounder. But make no mistake, uh, old Bowler's a very, very good angler. He's very thorough. Nothing fancy, no big frills or fancy rigs or anything like that, but what he does is very neat and very well thought out. And uh, he takes the best of everything he's sort of picked up from fishing with decent anglers and gets the very best out of that and then puts his own slant on it. And... Uh, it's no surprise to me, if he'd have turned himself to, into just a pure carp angler, I've got very little doubt that he'd be right up there, you know, with uh, the very best carp anglers, because he's, he's got that, that drive, he's driven, you know. Uh, you can guarantee, you know, when I might be him doing decorate, you know, looking out the window thinking about fishing, I know bowlers out there doing it, he might be after dace or grayling or barbel or whatever, he's there. Uh, so yeah, it's an immense drive with uh, Martin, and uh, uh, I've, I've fished with a lot of people that were great fun uh, abroad as well. You know, I fished with Ronnie De Groot. Nick Kelly was lovely as well. I had some nice times fishing with Nick. You know, a hell of a character. All his uh, 
his, his love of Euro fishing is well documented and uh, he wears his heart on his sleeve, you know, his pure passion for carp fishing and it shows, you know, and it was always nice. Uh, just so many, Terry Hearn as well, we worked together with Dynamite and uh, me and him had a lot of respect and a lot of time for each other, you know, and uh, it's still nice to bump into him and, and see him and I've always had a lot of time for his his personality as well as his angling side he's a real nice fella you know he's got not a bad bone in his body i'll tell he's uh he's a one-off i think as they say you know very very nice man so there's probably there's so many i could mention that are not in that in the public eye that are that are special as well you know awesome anglers but uh those are just a few of the guys that spring to mind that i've fished with you know that i'm very fond of so yeah, that's 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 the quick answer to that one. Uh, well, I think the golden era. I, I keep rehashing the same old shit, really, because it's it's so special to me. Uh, I think it was that transitional point where I took that plunge and decided to fish a single up bait in the middle of Reedsmere. And uh, it lasted all of 20 seconds on a, on a water that could be quite difficult to say the least. And then it just opened up a whole new ball game of, uh, it's like having the hair rig when no one else had it basically. And uh, you could, people used to gather in my swim waiting for six o'clock in the morning to come when the the fish were fizzing up in the middle of the lake in the sanctuary area and I was the only one doing it with single hook, two single hook baits out there and you'd see a big explosion of bubbles and then I was away and it was just like clockwork like metronomical sort of serial hauling basically on a difficult water and then I was you know that was the one water where it really shone particularly amazing and then it was getting the uh, the higher track singles came off that started off using them quite quite visual to get in the the dayglow white dye then i used that in food baits and that was just like electrifying it was just like because everyone was on like bland dark baits so i had white free offerings and white hook baits uh 1982 it was just crazy. It was phenomenal. Uh, you know, it was just catching fish and over fist. Then I had the fluorescent pink. Uh, that was amazing. Then there was that time when I uh, started messing with particles. Uh, Realised that every man and his dog were on boilies. Um, not all, but mostly. And uh, started fishing in Shropshire. I went on Hales's place that... Um, um, Acton Bunnell it wasn't my cup of tea really to be fair but he gave me a challenge and uh, gave me a ticket and said I could fish it because he wanted to show me that any fish that I caught he'd got photos of going back to 10 pounders and things so that was the challenge so I went on there and uh, had a 40 within like four hours using the method and uh I was using the method like a single hook bait, no freebies, no whopper dropper, firing balls in, no spawning. Everything that I used was encapsulated in that one method. I had liquid liver in it. I'd really, it was like having the most exquisite boily recipe, but I'd used it in my method. I had embuteric in there. I had all kinds of goodies in it. I mean, I'd really gone to town with what you could put in that ball. And I made the ball so it would explode and break down fairly quickly. The hook length was long with a coated hook length, so it'd fall away from the ball and the ball would spit and explode. Leave two pieces of balanced maize, just sat on the outer edge of that and the, the fish just couldn't resist it. Uh, so it culminated, I think the most I had in a day was 18 fish and a lot of these were 30s. So I had uh, 56 30s, six 40s, uh, and untold 20s from, in a, in a, I think it was 14 sessions. 
that was a bit special. That was good. And uh, I still couldn't reproduce that because some of the ingredients that I was using at the time, I was using that dynamite meaty marine ground bait in a tin. And believe it or not, that was one of the best things they ever did. That that was awesome stuff, and I was using that in the method. And uh, surprisingly, as well, when I, when I weighed, I recreated the mix as best I could. And how the hell I ever stopped using that, I'll never know, because it was one of the most successful things I've ever used in my life. All the other members, I mean, Rob Ailes, who, who, who owns Acton and all the lakes. He banned everything in the end. He says, you're putting my fish under too much pressure. And he says, and he says, I don't want any of the other members copying you. I want them on boilies feeding my fish. Which, which wasn't strictly true. I, I was using 20 kilos of method mix, just recasting all the time. Every time I seen a fizzer or a fish show, it'd get a method ball on it. Anyway, when I come to weigh them, I, the, the base method feeder was either two or three ounces. But when I weighed the ball, believe it or not, it was 12 ounces. So I was hurling 12 ounces around on some NG Century NG, three and a half pound Tesco rods, and they're not a beast of a rod, they're a, they're a softish rod. So can you imagine that? 12 ounces on those things. And uh, so it shows what abuse rods will really take. You know, a lot of people are scared of putting heavy leads on, and, uh, you know, they'll, they'll take a lot more than people think. So... I think that was an ace period. I mean, I could go on for ages about how good that was. I took it, I got back in Stoke-on-Trent, who owned Reedsmere as well. And as a little, little aside from fishing on Acton, I went on the mere and first night I had two on the method, fishing in the spinny. Uh, same setup and everything. And uh, I took it all over the place, that. And it, it, it was genuinely a game changer. It was very, very good. Even if I was fishing it on the margins, I had... Uh, I was doing a feature for uh, Improve Your Course Fishing. It's linked with the Angling Times. And I went out with this guy. And I had uh, a brace, both 33 pounds on Hardwick Smiths. And he went, the journalist who was with us, he went, what are you playing at? I said, what do you mean? I said, I'm dead chuffed with that. He goes, them fish are ridiculous. They're way too big for the feature. So I thought that was quite funny. He said, uh, our readers don't get all this big fish fishing. He says, I wanted, I wanted you to catch a couple of 10 pounders or something. I says, well, why didn't you tell me? We wouldn't have come on here. But that was on the method. You know, a lot of people were spawning and fishing to the, to the bar down the centre of uh, Ardwick. And this came just under my feet. And I lost another 30 on that session as well. One of the big commons in there, it was about 36 pound at the time. I lost it at the net. So that method technique, which a lot of anglers frown on the method, I think that's got some hellish mileage in it because you can put the liquids in, which I think is very important. A lot of the solid bag fishing and the... I mean, you can use some of the goos and all that, I get that. But if you wanted to use some, some of the more, you know, the juice from sweet corn, for example, which is a hell of an attractor, or the tiger nut juice, some of that will melt PVA, whereas you can use it in a method mix. You know, you can actually have it really quite full of it, loaded with it. So I think there's a lot, a lot of mileage in that. I think that was a good period in my time. Uh, game changer. Uh, the, the advantage of my ability for long range fishing as well was very good in that period. You know, I tended to choose waters where there was an area that's sort of difficult to hit. And anywhere like that used to play into my hands, you know. Same with Mark Hutchinson, Terry Edmonds. You can guarantee if there's waters like Grenville or something, you know, where you've got limitations of the leads you can use, the size of leads and the, the, the breaking strain line and no shot leaders, anyone that's a good long-range caster will shine in them situations. So, you know, I used to look for it on purpose, that kind of scenario. So, uh, yeah. Ooh, blimey. Well, they've all had a part to play in it, really. I think the single hook bait fluoros was, without a doubt, probably the the biggest game changer. 
at the time because it ticked so many boxes, you know. There was, you could, you didn't have to bait and wait, basically, and sit there waiting for fish coming to you. Uh, you know, it was, a lot of people in the early days failed to get their head around the fact that the fish would quite easily just pick up a, a single hook bait that was very visual like that and strongly flavoured. Uh, you know, it was a question, we all used to think, when's it going to blow? Or when's it going to conk out and run out of steam? It has, it has to a degree. It's nowhere near like as good as it used to be. Yeah, you can imagine, it's, I suppose the comparison is it's like being the, the, only, the only bloke in a nightclub full of women. And then it gradually changing and you being one of many blokes in a nightclub full of women, you know, your chances are going to get reduced. And that's how it was. It was like having them fluoros first or being on, on it at the time. It, if you're the only person using that, it's like, it's unique. It was amazing. So you could literally turn up and not, not have to sit and put a load of baits out or wait for them to come to you. You know, the fact is, you were highly mobile, you'd just put a couple of singles on the fish and it would go. Simple as that. Very rarely fail. You used it on the Manor Farm. And the uh, first time I went, I had the box common and the random linear. This was probably about 95 with fluorescent pink baits fishing in the back of the old arena that used to exist on the gravel workings. I worked out that the fish were probably sat in there and I got up a poplar tree and had a look and there they were all like little ants. The silhouettes of fish moving round in the very back corner of the arena. So banged a couple in. And uh, yeah, I had those. And then uh, it just kept working and it worked on and virtually everywhere I tried it. Uh, tried it in Belgium when I made that film the Gardner film with the Belgians. Very first cast in 80 acres of water with 108 known fishing. It was out there probably 15 seconds before I got a run because the Belgian fish had never been exposed to fluoros and uh, that approach. Because the Belgians were using a boat and you think about it, these guys that use radio controlled boats or anything it's an alien thing to go out in a boat in the middle of an inland sea and just put a single hook bait in. You just don't do it. You have to put some food in. You have to. But therein lies the problem. You've given the game away. You've given them a choice. Whereas a group of hungry fish, if they come across one, one, it's like having a, a gang of hungry, hungry kids come in and there's one sandwich on the table or one sweet. They're all going to fight over it put a table full in front of them and they're not so aggressive about the way that they go about it but put one there and it's whoa I want it and it's the same with a group of fish and that's how it was and I'd fathom that out as soon as you start giving them choice you, you kind of we put free offerings in there for the main reason is to draw attention to your hook baits so I wanted to draw attention to my hook bait without any free offerings that's all it was so I wanted to make it as visual as possible and as smelly as possible and as attractive as possible without going through all the nonsense of feeding the fish. I had a few people say, oh, you're an old tight bastard you are. It's just because you don't want to put any food in and you're too tight to bait up. It was nothing of the sort. I, could, I used to make tons of bait when I was using bait. I always had bait with me. But I liked everyone else to feed the fish and keep the weights big. Well, I was using the singles to pick them off. It was like being a sniper, a specialist sniper. That's how I, uh, I compare that. But if you, you know, you look back on the, it's still doing it now. People are still falling back on, look at the companies out there that have made a fortune out of doing fluoros. You know, God knows how much money they've earned from it. You know, sticky baits, mainline, and imagine how many they sell, them companies and, you know, all of them. It's incredible. I mean, half, half their income probably comes from that train of thought from as a follow-on, you know. Uh, so I think, oh, that lot owe me a few beers. So, yeah. <laughs> Is that, was that complete enough, that answer? Yeah, yeah that sounded good to me. Yeah, I'm just...
Oh, it's changed a lot. I mean, you can imagine in 1970, we were freelining balls of paste and uh, sat there with a, a little bike battery with a couple of wires attached to a, light, a, a miniature bicycle headlamp bulb in a jam jar with silver paper as indicators and, you know, uh, on the floor uh, and making our own rod rests and things like that. And oh, it was crazy. Uh, very very little literature now everything's i think the only thing that really bothers me at the moment is when you you watch all these films that the different companies make i think someone coming into carp fishing can feel very very inadequate because they'll watch these films and watch like you know you want say just as an example mark bartlett or uh uh Tom Maker, where it just, they seem to be having constant hauls of big fish. And, you know, even though I've been doing it like for 50 years, you kind of look at it and think, shit, what, what am I doing here? You know, some of these guys have got it off to, and they're sort of like nomadic, they seem like they're living on the bank all the time. Uh, well, that isn't the case. It's just that they, they choose the venues where they're going. They've got a very polished act together. Uh, a lot of them are, you know, uh, match competition type, type carp anglers and they've honed their catching ability doing that kind of thing so they know exactly how important it is to be baiting up all the time like in a match fishing parlance they don't just sit and wait and put it all in when they arrive so but I think uh, a lot of anglers will turn up on more modest venues that haven't got anything like the heads of fishing where you see in the in the media portrayed, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of the big fish waters, let's face it, are, are down south or Cambridgeshire or Oxfordshire or Essex. Uh, and if you live up north and, you you know, some waters still, if you catch a 20 pounder, it's like you punch in the air sort of thing. So I think a lot of anglers have, uh, uh, basically live in the wrong part of the country and it's very easy for uh, youngsters in them places or even more senior guys that take it up getting very disillusioned because not every throw is a coconut and you can watch it and think shit am i getting it all wrong and you're not getting it wrong it's just that you it's all about the venue you're on and you know uh how it's portrayed sometimes it makes it look a lot easier than it actually is uh, I think that's a bit strange. I think sometimes too much information's uh, a nightmare, you know, and there's all this play on rigs, all the, so many myriads of different types of rigs that you can use probably gets like a minefield for newcomers to the sport. And I think that's a bit strange. Uh, I also think Maybe it's the romantic side of the carp angling isn't it, history that I've got. I think it's very important to make your own upbaits, minimum. I mean, I, I like making food bait as well as hook baits, you know. I think it's... it's, it's I don't even buy ready-done particles. I make my own, or prepare my own, let's put it that way. I mean, I know, I know it's convenient. A lot of people that are in a nine-to-five are working away. Uh, and they, they want every spare moment when they're not with the family, not actually rolling bait or preparing particles and steaming the wallpaper off and things like that. But I, I think it's a very important part of the learning process because if you're buying everything online all the time or ready done, you kind of don't know what's making things work or not work. Whereas if you do it yourself, you're only blaming yourself so that way you're learning that's how i learned all the inclusion rates in the hook baits i was making obviously if it was just a question of levels didn't matter there'd be no learning process but there was a huge difference because i used to fish for example i'd have a fluoro that was maybe fluorescent orange i'd make one up with no flavoring and no, no attraction whatsoever, because I wanted to see if it was purely a, a visual thing or whether it was the flavours that were doing it as part of the package. And I'd make up another hook bait with 
the typical five mil to one egg in and then I'd make another and go extreme with it. Typically 30 mil to one egg, which basically Rod Hutchinson in, in his writings always said that there's an area of where you repel them. I'd agree with food bait, but not with a single hook bait. It's a different ball game entirely. So when I started doing it with a single hook baits, Surprise, surprise, I was expecting the one with no flavouring and that to catch more fish than it did. It was absolutely crap. Which told me that the flavour had a huge influence in pickups as well as the visual aspect. There was the attraction thing as well. It's a bit like, I suppose it's a bit like uh, having a whiskey that doesn't smell of whiskey. You know, you associate the smell of whiskey with the taste. And I think it was a little bit like that. It's like having a, a strawberry that tasted of nothing. It, you know, it looks like a strawberry, but it doesn't smell of it. And to, to carp, I think part of that, uh, the olfactory system is triggered by the, the, the molecules of flavour and attraction going into the nares and triggering that feeding response. And it's definitely the case. Because one of the things I noticed with the uh, singles was that they were, they were crap in the dark. That's why initially I thought it may just be a visual cue. That's why I was testing the fluoros without any flavours in whatsoever. And I also thought, as some of the other guys were getting onto the single hook baits, I thought if I start catching them without any flavouring whatsoever, uh, that'll be a jump on anyone else. And that's why I also thought with super high levels of uh, additives in there, no one else would think of doing it to them, them extremes. That's why I was testing that as well. So I was testing them against each other. Uh, the overflavoured singles completely annihilated the 5 mil and the no flavour versions. And then I worked out why I wasn't catching many fish in the dark. Well, it was quite simple. I was predominantly fishing the singles at extreme ranges, usually in a, what I can only describe as a sanctuary, a daytime sanctuary where they'd get out of the way where they knew they were safe. But you can imagine in the daytime, they think they're safe out there, but they've scoured the bottom to such a degree there's not a stick of food that exists there. So it's like, cattle grazing in a field they vet everything in one part of the field and they need to get to the other part where the grass is to feed on it hence the fish would come into the margins where the anglers would typically sat at night and feed in the margins when it was quiet when everyone was asleep and i realized that and started fishing close in at night or else my other option would be to blast the singles out and what would happen is that as just as dawn was coming, the fish would back off and go back into the sanctuary and I'd have the singles waiting for them and then it'd be bang, bang, bang. But they were feeding at night, okay. It was just they were feeding in a different place in the margins. So I, I tried to get the best of both. So I'd fish the margins at night on bait and fish the singles in the daytime at range. And it was just about working out that, uh, the tactical sort of, the best approach. So yeah. Uh, I forgot what the original question was, but I've gone off on one again, haven't I? About how, uh, how is in 2020 compared to... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think... No doubt there's loads of people still experimenting and doing their own thing, but I think... I, I like a lot of the things that are happening in the current scene, you know. I mean, there's, there's some fabulous equipment that, you know, the clothing and the... Uh, the sleeping bags we used to freeze to death in this basically it was like an ordeal winter fishing when i was young you know uh it good job i had a good constitution because i've i would have snuffed it a few times it was that cold you know literally we used to go into blacks or millets and buy a sleeping bag for a fiver and wonder why you were freezing to death you know i mean uh, there was many a time i'd wake up and i i, I couldn't i couldn't feel i couldn't feel me me legs because my hands had fell off <laughs> but uh, yeah so it was medieval the the equipment we had in them days but bloody hell we enjoyed it you know but uh yeah that, the gear you've got now is incredible but 
Uh, I like the fact you can buy stuff on eBay online and it's there the following day virtually and that as well. You know, that's great. There's a lot of good stuff. I don't like the... The instant uh, Instagram, even though I do it myself to a degree, I just think everything's a little bit too exposed. You know, you uh, you see these posts off people all the time, and you think, "Oh, he's caught another forty, he's caught an upper 30. and it's like it's like a machine. You think that these guys must never be off it, and they must be on the bank all the time. And I think. To your average guy, that, that must be a little bit demoralising as well, where you sat there thinking, shit, where did it all go wrong in my fishing, you know? And then you realise you're not on them venues with the head of big fishing. You're not able to put that time in. It's not a level playing field. You know, a lot of people get disillusioned with carp fishing, and it is never, ever a level playing field. You, if we are the clocking in system where you do 40 hours a week on the bank and you all take it in turns on the same same awesome waters, that might be different. But don't forget, it's, it's not a competition. Subliminally, a lot of anglers think it is a competition and that, you know, it's, it's a giant game where it's competitive and it's a bit of a shame that and it's not. It really isn't. And as long as you, you're happy doing what you you're doing and enjoying what you the thing that you're doing and the reasons why you're going I think that's the most important thing nothing's changed from the 70s when I started to how I feel about it now on that respect but uh, I, I think you're under more pressure now because everything's so instant to you know you find yourself sort of almost compelled to put it on Instagram the second you've caught something and you think Hang on, everybody suddenly knows where I am in this moment. I've had it on this place. I've put it on there that I've had a nice hit. You can literally see it filling up in front of your eyes the same day. And they're going, especially with this furlough business, they're going, oh, seeing you're on, thought I'd better get on. And you're like, hang on, I've had to move the rods out of a going spot. You know, you're fishing slightly out of your swim. That's you finished. So I don't like that side of it. And, you know, I don't blame it, blame anyone for not falling into the uh, social media side. Uh, so, yeah, but it is what it is, you know. It's uh, It's been bloody kind to me. I've always made a living from it. Not all my life, but a lot of it. And, uh, you know, you, you can't. You've got to take the rough with the smooth. You can't have every way. So I think the fact it's become a lot more commercial in some ways has made life easier, you know, especially with the uh, the companies that are willing to employ you. It's it's a vehicle to keep them happy. So you, you have to play the game. So as much as I dislike it in one way, I like it in another way, you know. So, yeah. Well, that's a difficult one, really. Uh, it, there, there was uh, the top flash at Winsford. I, f I, I fished there. That that was quite a pain in the ass, quite difficult. But when I look back and analyse why, I was working in advertising, and uh, so I, I did I had a nine to five. Well, I wasn't. I was on an evening shift, and I, I used to work. Monday to Friday, and then the boss had come in. He was like uh, the Gestapo. Ken Gray's name was, and he'd say, right, Saturday, Sunday, this this weekend, I'll have you in or else it'd be a Saturday. And you had no choice. If, if I didn't do it, someone else would get the job. So I used to just get Sundays to go fishing. And uh, the top flash, you couldn't start till about six in the morning. Then there'd be a queue and it'd be like the wacky races running down to the swims. And uh, my wife used to finish work. She She worked on the airport. And our only time together was usually a Sunday. So she, she would do the mornings. She, she worked in the perfumery on the airport. And she'd finish about two o'clock. So I'd have to be home to take her out to the pub. And then, so literally, I had, you know, six hours fishing on a Sunday when it was busy as hell. 
And then I was beating myself up that I'd not sort of caught a load of fish. So I, I realised why. It was all down to time and uh, application. And uh, eventually I caught, you know, some of the some of the better fish out there and that. But I remember that being frustrating at the time. And then there was a quite a lot of the regulars that were comparing their results with mine. And then I realised that they were on the dole and full-timers spending literally all week down there, you know, and how can you compare the two? But I, I, I still had a bit of notoriety at that time after my exploits on Reedsmere and that, and I think they expected me to be a miracle worker. A lot of them were reveling in it that I didn't just turn up and annihilate it, you know. But I'd, I had no time, it was as simple as that. Uh, time equates to a lot of success, really. Uh, you have to have the time and the... You know, at your disposal. Make no make no bones about that. No no one's great enough to just turn up and do it in a few hours. You need to you need a little bit of time. You need to neglect something to make it work. It's either the family or uh, work that suffers. You can't have it every way. So there was there, and uh, try to think of where else. Elstow was a bit of a ball breaker. I uh, I only fished it an handful of times, but it was. Uh, yeah, all the regulars on there weren't, most of them were very unpleasant. They'd fished it for years, you know, maybe 20 years, knew it like the back of the hand and it'd be like 30 foot deep with little pinnacles that had come up that were less than the size of a top of a bivvy. I remember when I went on with Oz, my mate, they were calling us rotten because we had a marker or doubt. Because they knew all the spots and had the lines marked. We were learning it, you know, and they were giving us some shit and everything. Uh, but I had a 40 the second time down, doing it my way on boilies, because they were all using hemp and corn, every single one of them, and I thought, I'm not playing that game, I don't want to play their game badly, so I did it my way. Uh, so I did have some success on there, and uh, they banned the chod rig as well, they seen me using the chod, it's one of the first places I tried it. That was working brilliantly with plastic tiger nuts, and tiger nuts got banned, and plastic baits, the chod got banned, so, uh, yeah, uh, trying to think where else. I don't think I've really had that many places where I've struggled when I've had the time or, you know, give it a proper campaign. Uh, no, not really. Um, I suppose that, no, there's always been a reason if something's not sort of clicked because I'm not that bad at a carp angler, you know, it's usually worked out and I've usually uh, done okay pro rata for the time I've done so no nothing springs to mind apart from those instances where again it was uh, you know um, familiarity with somewhere that's a tricky water you have to go through the learning process uh, before it happens and then the other one was somewhere where I didn't have enough time so yeah the reason for it It's, a, it's an interesting question, that. I think, uh, how can you say that catching big carp's an instinct? I, I think catching big carp's more about getting in the right venue where they live. I mean, I'm presuming that you mean once you're in that venue that's got the said big fish in, is it more of an instinct? I think it's more of uh, how much time you're willing to put in and what lengths you're prepared to go to. I think there isn't many anglers that that have a stable home life and family with children that they're bringing up and uh, being the main breadwinner where they can devote the time to make it a quick job unless you get lucky. So I think uh, a campaign for big fish is is about using the old grey matter. I think uh, there's no set formula. I think because, you know, you, anywhere with big fish in, if, if they're all big, there's a good chance of catching a big one, isn't there? But if, if you've got one big one and, say, 220s in there and 150 or a 40 or something, 
you just got to go through the numbers, haven't you, and put the time in and hope that the big one comes. Uh, I mean, I, I remember Terry Hearn, he, he always used to prefer waters where there was much lower stock density so that when you inevitably got a bite, it was probably going to be a better chance. Say there was five fish in the water or ten fish, it was a one in ten rather than a one in 300. You know, you... Because I remember on wazing, it took him a lot more time to catch the big one because he, he had to virtually wade through everything on the on the venue, you know. So I think uh, the venue choice is super important. Uh, but as I've alluded to before, it's uh, the amount of times I've seen everyone's after a target fish on a lake and then you've got a new guy turns up. He'll go in a swim that's considered crap, you know, somewhere that you'd only go as a last resort. Every lake's got one where you go, well, why has he gone in there? It's shit in there. I've never seen outcome out of that. That's because no one fishes it. Or it's got a reputation from the past of being crap. He'll go in there, use something completely obscure. He's not fell into the trap of using the same... Everyone gravitates to a certain way of fishing on a certain water you know on Elstow it used to be like in the old days it was the hemp and corn approach mass baiting with hemp with a little bit of corn in there and everybody kind of did it and all the waters it might be a boily water you know uh, or you know on, on Wellington it, the, the rumour was out there that it was a boily water and you needed massive beds of boilies 20 millers and that which wasn't the case at all, but that was the per perception and the the local hearsay was that that's the way you, you had to do it. Well, I think if you were to get pro rata, uh, someone that's a fairly solid angler and put them on all the, the, the big fish waters in the unpopular swims, just as a, as a, an experiment I think a lot of big fish would get caught like that because obviously swims that have got a reputation for not doing bites or fish get left alone so there's no line pressure there's no angling pressure in there so a lot of the time the fish ain't stupid they're going to sit in there as a sanctuary so it's just sat waiting to be done. So you'll get your new member typically turn up he'll not know any better because he's not spoke to the the regulars, he'll go in somewhere and everyone will go, why has he gone in that? And then bang, he's had the big one. It's not, not a big surprise really when you think about it. It sort, sort of like makes sense that the fish, part of you's thinking, well, maybe the fish are going to frequent where anglers are baiting up regular, but they ain't stupid. They also go where they're left alone. So I think quite a lot of the time they'll be in those swims that are neglected like that and left alone you know especially where there's no trees overhanging that give the game away that they're in there you know i remember i was fishing birch grove for example and i had a string of the big ones and i worked out all the angles where people would cast because each, each sort of swim had a, was had boards like this and it'd have a canopy of trees so you were limited to where you could actually physically cast because of the trees not being pr pruned back so what I did, I started working out some unusual angles where they wouldn't have seen a hook bait tying the trees back with that blue sort of washing line stuff so I could get a, some acute strange angles and that caught me loads of fish and then when I'd finished the session I'd just let the branches back out where they were it meant a bit of tree climbing and stuff but by using that and trying to work out all those strange angles, I'm sure I caught a lot of bonus fish doing that. You know, and it's the same with, it's no surprise that if you go in any given swim, if you've got, say you've got one telegraph pole that's sort of at 10 o'clock in a swim, that's pretty featureless, weed on the bottom, you'll bang the lead out where the telegraph pole is and slide it across the bottom and it's probably going to be like glass or be a, a naked spot where the fish have 
been used to finding bait and they've scoured it and cleaned it. And so it's pretty predictable. So is that the spot that you want to be on for the big fish? Super predictable. They've obviously been fished for all the time from the going spot in the said swim. This part of me thinks it's probably valid because you pre present him perfectly every time. But also these fish aren't stupid. They're going to go seen that before. So I think too much knowledge goes against you sometimes for catching big fish. I think not listening to what other people tell you, uh, by all means, take it on board, but the damage is done then, isn't it? You know, how many times do you come to a lake, oh, you don't want to be in that swim, mate, you want to be down there, and you think, is it bullshit or is it real? But, but it still plays with your mind. I think you've got to go off your own instincts, I do. The hunting instinct's massive in some people, you know, and I think never ignore that. I always go with my own gut feeling, really, and it, it's done me okay so far, and I think, I think that that's what people should do. I think the, the first thing that brought attention to just how interesting France was, for example, was... Uh, Paul Regent did some uh, pioneering stuff along with a few others on uh, Cassian. And uh, we start reading about Kevin Maddox and uh, Max Cottis and a few people like that that had had these uh, monster fish on Cassian at the time. You know, we've seen Rod Hutchinson as well with like. Uh, you know, 57 pounder and stuff like that. You think, Jesus Christ, miles bigger than the British record. And you're thinking, wow, it's a dream to do it. And I was immediately thinking, I've got to drive there, you know, and do that. And uh, then I started just paying more attention to any snippets that I got about uh, big fish that have been caught in the River Seine and stuff like that in the past. Started uh, doing a bit of research and seeing that there have been 60 pounders caught and bigger. Thinking, well, obviously the climate's better and I knew there'd been big fish caught in, in Italy and uh, Croatia and places like that. So, yeah, I, 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 just, I just wanted to sample it to see how it was just as a holiday really it started just you know i'll go for a week or two weeks and then i realized just how fabulous it all is and untouched and un unspoiled you know not every fish had names or you know uh, a track record of captures all through its life and it'd be seemed like because of the war both wars the french seeded every single bit of blue in the whole of France with uh, carp as food. Same in a lot of European countries. They put fish in all the public park lakes and everything for people to eat. So that's why they're so widespread and in all the canal systems massively and in all the rivers. Every, every piece of water's got carp in on the continent, basically. Whereas in England, it's been more of a we didn't have carp before the Romans arrived, so obviously the carp aren't as widespread. There's all the Lake District lakes that have got no carp in, or maybe a few live baits for pike fishing that have survived. But there's, there's tons of expanses of water in Wales and everywhere that have never seen a carp, you know. But that wouldn't happen on the continent. So those fish were a specific strain that were bred for the table, typically less scales on them. So they're fast growers, because again, for the table, they wanted them to pack weight on quickly to, to provide protein. So the strain was an absolute cracking strain of fish that they tended to use. So the fish had typically could reach 40 pound in, you know, five years. Whereas it might take a lifetime in England for the strains that we had to do that. So obviously, uh, everything was in your favor going to the continent for catching monsters you know, so it, it was all there. So that was what the draw was really. Uh, so 
yeah, I mean, I can't think of a single year where I've not been two or three or four times to the continent, you know, f f since probably the late 80s. So it's it's been th at least 30 years worth, you know, times up by five. It's quite a few trips, isn't it? So, yeah. Yeah, the uh, I suppose the, the first trip was 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 uh, incredible. Oh, so many trips were fantastic, but the first one was uh, interesting because we didn't even know if we were on the right lake, and because uh, we'd seen pictures of Joe Taylor and Alan Taylor, where they wrote in Malin's big carp book, give the game away, showing all these mega fish with it like a a tide lestry with the tide out. We knew it was a reser, but when we got there, it looked completely different because we weren't we weren't sure if that was the, indeed the right place because it was full. The level was right up to the top and it looked completely different. We thought, shit, is it the wrong place? Anyway, these Dutch came round and they said they'd had all the gear confiscated for night fishing. So we thought, hmm, don't know about this. So I sat there night fishing we're knackered after the journey with my scissors ready to cut the lines. I know it's not sort of very correct now saying that, but in them days, you know, it was shit. If the police come and you're going to get all your gear taken away, what would you rather do? Probably find, go in and drag the lines out later, but cut them and run, you know, pretend you're not fishing. So uh, that was desperate measures prepared for in them days. And then uh, I remember having a I heard the fish crashing at distance and they came closer and closer till they hit where I'd got a little bit of bait and then I had one that was, uh, I think it was 38 pound. I remember going up to the boys and say, boys, look at this. I think we're on the right place. And then it just went mental. We were, we were fishing every night. You know, you were shitting yourself because you were scared of getting caught by the police. It was like a game of cat and mouse. The police had come and check and everything. And, We'd be on the ball and literally grab the rods and run, you know, just fishing way back. Just take your chair down and sit with your rods in the dark. And uh, same thing every time. The fish would be right out at distance. And then as the night wore on, you'd hear them crashing closer and closer. And all four rods had just burst into life. It was, it was mad. And uh, as we got to know the place, we, we started realising that all the night fishing spots were getting battered usually by the English. And the fishing slowed right off. So I thought, right, let's start fishing some of the day only spots. And that's when it really, it really did become an ordeal, but the, the results were incredible. You know, they, uh, I remember us going down to, there was three of us fishing and we went to this, this Port de Nuzmont. It was like a, a yacht club. And the level was really down and we had to walk about a quarter of a mile across mud flats. It was like, it was for all the world, like an estuary with the tide out. So we were taking, I rolled 280 kilo of bait by on a shillum for us to, to take our bait for the trip. And uh, massive, you know, big white buckets full of boilies and they soaked them in halibut oil to keep them fresh. Because none of them had preservative in or all like that. And uh, so we thought 280 kilo of bait for 10 days was immense amount, you know, but it wasn't really, but it worked. So we went down and we were, uh, had the wind in our face. We yomped out of this spot and I, I, I already knew what was coming. The other two lads had never been before. They'd never been to Shanty. So they weren't prepared for the mud, I don't think. So I, I got uh, sheets of plastic from an hardware store that were about as big as a tarp off a truck. So I put that down on the mud to at least try and keep it a little bit of semblance of neatness. And we just, because we were traveling light, we'd each got a 50 inch brolly. We'd stick it in the mud, even though it was windy as hell and we got some of the, the brollies blown inside out and blown away and things. We're fishing the teeth for this wind and we'd done three days of getting down at, in the dark in the morning because you couldn't night fish so we were yomping down maybe five trips each to get all the gear down the bait and everything through all this mud it was sucking your waders off pulling your boots off you got blisters on your feet and then we got throwing sticks and we're there for hours baiting up putting tons of bait in 
And we had a sausage three days, and these two were getting super pissed off with us. They thought, we're in the wrong spot, it's not going to happen. And I kind of knew we had to call them in. It takes some time for the, the message to go out that there's food there. And it might take a, a day, sometimes two days. All it takes is one fish to stumble across that food. Somehow they're like birds, they bring the rest. So that had happened. So these two were whinging about it. And one of them, Tony, he was in the police and we'd gone in his vehicle with a trailer on the back. I'll never forget it. He said, uh, right, I've had enough now. He said, it's my car, I'm pulling rank on you. He said, uh, we've wasted three days. We're going to a lake I know near Paris. So I said, no, I'm not going. I says, we've put in a shitload of bait and I'm going to sit it out. And he said, no, no, no. He said, if, if, if you don't listen, we're just going to leave you here and drive off and leave you. And I says, well, what happens then? He says, well, we'll come back in a, we'll come back in a week and pick you up. So I said, okay, you're gonna to have to do it then. So I was prepared for them to drive away and leave me by myself for a week. And uh, that's how Kina was. So they, they went off to a cafe to get some French sticks and discuss the situation, have a coffee. And strangely enough, they left the rods out. I told them to wind them in. So they left two, three rod setups and I've got four out. i never forget this. So they've just disappeared and I've seen the lights on the trailer come on because it was still sort of fairly dull, just coming into proper light. So they've, they're disappearing when uh, I've got my first bite. One of my rods just cranked over on a four rod set up and I'm playing it. And then one of my other rods went and I thought that had, the fish was playing had picked up one of my other lines and it wasn't, it was another bite. And then all four of them go, so you imagine I'm by myself and I've got four fish on at once. And the, all I can remember was just the indicator screaming, you know, with the spools spinning. And I'm thinking, oh shit. So I'm playing them like a madman. And uh, by some miracle, I managed to net all four of them. And then uh, one of their rods goes off. And it was Andy Kerr's rod, I'll never forget it. And I ran over, wound down on it, hit it. And then uh, had a bit of a monster battle with it. And I thought, Jesus Christ, it, it beached itself. I didn't know what there was a, just like a mud hump in front of him, like a spit, but it was really shallow. And you couldn't see because the water was that coloured. It was like tomato soup where the wind was churning it up. Anyway, I went over the top of my waders, which I was pissed off about because it was fucking cold. You know, it was really cold. It was the end of October. Uh, teeth chattering sort of weather, you know. So it's over the top of my waders. I'm like, oh shit. So I give it a load of elbow and then see this fish and it's a big 60. It might have been a 70 even, I don't know, but they were rare as rocking hot shit in them days. You know, it's 30 odd years ago. And I seen this thing, you could have saddled it up and rode it around the lake, it was massive. And I'm thinking, you bastards, you've gone off and left me with all these rods. If the guard the pest come, I'm gonna get crucified as well. So now I've got, it typically it didn't come on my bloody rod, it come on Andy Kerr's rod and he's not even there. So I'm thinking, well, it's a non-capture for him. So I might as well just get it out. I'm already thinking ahead. I thought I'll just whack his rig back out and say it came on one of my rods, which is how I thought in them days because I was so pissed off about what they were forcing me to, to, to do, you know, try and pack up and everything. So I thought, oh, fuck it. I'll just unhook it, put it in the sling and I'll say I've had it on my bollocks to him. Anyway, that was during the fight. I was thinking ahead. This is what I was thinking in my mind. And uh, uh, he was using one of them Kevin Maddox Partridge Z, Z2 hook, I think it was. Size two and it snapped the fucking hook. Honestly, the hook just snapped on this fish. And uh, it, where it had locked up on this, this bar, I think it must have put a lot of pressure on the hook hold and when I got the other angle on and freed it, I think it must have been right on the edge of snapping and the hook snaps and that was gone. So I was super pissed about that just because I wanted to see how big it was because it was a huge fish. Anyway, I put a new bait on and whacked it out on his rig, uh, tied another rig, put it out for him. And then I had more fish, so it kicks off on me and I'm having loads of action. I ran out of sacks in the end, so I'm using their sacks. They've got brand new sacks still in the bags. So I'm tearing the packets open using all their sacks. 
I think I got seven or eight fish sacked up and they come back. But I never said a word. So I, everything had sort of had a bit of a lull, but what I had done, they were each using three rods each, so they'd got a fourth, so I got the fourth out and got a spare buzzer out, so I'd, I'd put them four rods each out. Which might seem strange, but I thought, in for a penny, in for a pound, I might as well have uh, 12 rods out. So, seeing as the big fish were in the area, because I didn't know how long it was going to last, this feeding spell. Anyway, uh, when they came back, they said, right, we've made a decision, we're packing up, we're going, and you're coming with us, we ain't going to come back for you. And I said, uh, keep watching your rods. Every now and again, during the conversation, I says, keep your eye on your rods with a smile on my face and this, this copper amongst them said what are you smiling at he said uh, we're telling you to pack up and you want to stay why are you smiling i said i'm smiling at your lack of observation i said have you not seen all them cords hanging off that bank stick there because it was colored the water they didn't see the sacks you see he went have you had uh, have, have you used our sacks i said yeah i said uh, i think i've got seven fish sacked up or eight a 40 and I think seven or eight upper 30s. And I says, and as for you, to the other one, I said, I've lost the pro probable upper 60 or a 70 on your rod. Just as I said it, one of his other rods blasted off and he had uh, a 48. And I thought, big fish in them days, you know. That was it then. They were all excited and didn't want to go anywhere. And we stayed and we absolutely beat the shit out of it. It was just the best fishing ever. We couldn't keep the rods in the water. A storm came, a hurricane, Hurricane Lily. I'll never forget it because my grandmother was called Lily and she died when we were there. And that's what they called the hurricane. And uh, in the end, we were covered from head to toe in mud, uh, completely drowned. We were sleeping at the top of the, the mud flats on this little bit of grass and then doing the same for 10 days. Can you imagine all our skin was cracked on our hands uh, your lips were split with the uh, winter sun and the wind and uh, we looked like I guess you know like when you see the gold rush in the Klondike where they've got all the big beards and they look all or, or uh, Scott the Antarctic when they've been out there for all that time and the hair everywhere and they got that sort of stare in your eyes we were like that it, but it, it was I wouldn't change a thing it was the most exciting fantastic fishing ever and that, in, in, in essence, is why I love the continent so much. You know, it's just, you just never know what's coming. And it's, it smells like the sea when you're on the shant. You know, you're there and you, you can't see the other side of the lake. You can just see lights at night in the distance, like a distant harbour. And it bloody smells like the sea. It smells salty, that sort of sea wind smell to it. And it's just hard to explain. And all you can hear is the spinnaker on the yachts with the on the yacht club and then beep you know fantastic you just don't know what's coming next and uh, yeah something very special about European fishing if you've never tried it just just do it just do it don't don't matter what you have to do once you've tried it I remember Gaz Ferran when he was a kid saying to me you know why do you like that Euro fishing because he was mad on Reedsmere and all the UK fishing at the time I says you'll see you'll see eventually you will see i think that's why old tell doesn't do it you know i think he's scared of uh, getting sidetracked and suddenly th realizing what he's been missing because um, i always used to say to him when we worked together i said if you tried it and you went on some of those public lakes in belgium and you know in uh, italy or in in parts of France, you know, near Lyon and that, some of them big park lakes there, they're dangerous, but they've put some absolute monsters in. I said, you'd go crazy on it. You'd, you'd go absolutely crazy. But I suppose everybody does it for their own reasons, you know, but if, you know, you, I've had a lot of people knocking European fish and European fishing that have never tried it, ironically. And I always find that strange. It's like just having your holidays in England and never going abroad and sampling some of the amazing places that you can go and you know it's just different so uh england is, is as beautiful as it is or britain for carp fishing it's just not the full picture 
it's only a little part of it, a microcosm of what's really out there, you know. So, uh, yeah, you, you've got to do it. Uh, well, I suppose uh, this eternal sort of uh, quest for getting another pleasing shot on your uh, phone or your camera, isn't it? Where you want, you know, there's something immensely satisfying about catching a an absolute pristine beast of a fish the, in its raw essence and getting that next bite from a, from a big fish is it never stops being a an absolute pleasure you know it's uh, it's like a being addicted to anything it's that next fix isn't it it's we we we're, we're carp addicts we're, I'm a carp addict I can't even though I've been doing it all this time it never diminishes that urge to hold another f awesome looking fish that's and the circumstances of the capture mean that sometimes you're going to have to do massive drives like to Croatia or it might be the south of England I've recently been fishing down at Emperor Lakes in Devon it was a 600 mile trip for a late autumn session did I care no I didn't care in the slightest uh, I didn't care about how much it cost for petrol I didn't care about how tired I was I didn't care about any of that I don't didn't care about it when I drove to Croatia and it took 54 hours to get back and I did all the driving because my mate couldn't drive my van because he, Henrik's from Norway and he didn't have a we couldn't insure him to take turns driving it, so I had to do all. Oh, we got stuck in traffic, it was 54 hours. You know, I was like dead on my feet when I got home, but I wouldn't change a thing. It's part of the part of the part of the fun of it all, because you feel like it's a giant adventure and you've got more more time to anticipate. And more time to think about what you're doing when you're uh, you're driving there and you've only got your own thoughts. So yeah, I, I, nothing diminishes on that front. I a lot of the uh, European anglers are amazed when I tell them that my average session was like down to Bluebell or something. It was like a 300 mile round trip just for a, uh, an overnighter or a, a two day trip, 48 hours. They go, what all that way? And I said, yeah. I said it's just normal for us because if you live in a an area where it, you're not blessed with so many big fish or really good carp waters, that's what you've got to do. So that was what it is. So it's not changed. No, I'll just. Uh, it's nice if you can get it closer. If I have to do it, I'll do it. So yeah. Uh, Cassian, for sure. Um, it must have been awesome in them early days to to be the first there, you know, and not knowing what you're going to do next. And, and obviously, uh, Reduta, late Reduta. Uh, I I missed the boat with that one. I could have been on the first ever trip for the English. Uh, I think that was about. Um, 96 something like that 97 uh Baldemar had just had that world record eight, 82 pound or 83 pound mirror and i remember i just started working for century at the time and uh john baker was going with kevin maddox and a few other people uh dennis mcfetrick and they asked me did i want to go so i got it all arranged to go and everything you know on a pioneering trip because no english had fished it just some germans uh, Austrians and uh, I got made redundant just before and I had a mortgage and all the rest of it my first mortgage 88 it was 88 and I I couldn't afford it and I was gutted and they went and they had a great time you know they caught quite a lot of big fish and stuff uh, but the first time I went was 
doing the World Championships in a match on there in uh, 2002. So I'd missed the best of it. And the fish kill just happened just after us. No, 2001, I think it was. And I went back again straight after. I loved it that much. I thought, I'm going to come and do my own pleasure fishing here. And I uh, had them up to mid-50s. And then... Yeah, what happened then was uh, they had the fish kill. And I'd kind of just discovered somewhere that was right on my street, you know, amazing fish and everything. And then I had it all pulled away from me, really. It was like all just destroyed. And groups were going over there and catching nothing. And I thought, they can't have all died, the fish, surely. And it, it just, I just couldn't comprehend that a lake that's 16 mile drive around the outside every single living fish in the whole place had snuffed it. So I couldn't, I was in a sort of state of denial. So I went over there, I got a trip planned. Everyone else dropped out and I was the only one that went. So I was, there was just me there on the whole lake by myself, which was kind of so surreal. So I went on the small lake, which is still about, I don't know, 60 acres or something. And I caught a 25 pound grass carp the first night. So I thought, oh, there's hope, I've caught something. And, uh, then I went on the main lake and uh, I didn't catch anything on there. No bites, never seen any fish, nothing. And I was packing up and I decided to walk around the lake as long as it was the walk. And I went in this water tower bay and I seen fish crashing. The only place I'd seen them. So I thought, well, they're not all dead then. So I went back again, sort of, I thought, Someone just called me to go back, so I went. Went in Water Tower Bay. Uh, I took another bloke with us, and two of us went, and it was incredible. Could hardly keep the rods in the water. It's like it had recovered, because it was a year later. And then I found out that it was the right-hand side, the right-hand arm of Reduta. For whatever reason, most of the fish had died in that part. And nothing was getting caught at all in there. And it was all in the right, uh, the left-hand side where the survivors had gone. And I don't know whether it was a pollution or really what it was. I heard rumours about it being various things. But, yeah, uh, and it's all the fish started to come back. Add them up to, I think, 46, something like that. Uh, lost a very big fish as well. That picked up another another rod with a 12 ounce lead on when I was playing it and the, the sorry, the, one of my lines that was already out caught on the fish so I'm playing it and the line going back to one of my rods on the bank with the 12 ounce lead on went right through the fish's mouth and it slid down the hook and that acted like a hooking device before we could get it in the net or up the fish. Looking back I think that was a mid 60 common maybe more and when i seen it go i could have cried it was just you know we were caught by the wind it was acting like a drogue and my mate's trying to get the net under the fish and and this bungee cord of my rod back on the bank that i'd lifted up was pulling like a piano string holding the fish back and he couldn't get the net under it and then when it unhooked it and it went i was like ah oh. and uh but for sure there were some big survivors at the time and then uh, yeah so it's a bit of a long-winded answer but yeah uh, Cassian and Reduta would have been the ones to have been on for sure no not really I uh, I did fish places where there was some, some big fish by national standards, but I uh, I always felt like I like alluded to before that I live too far away. Uh, unlike a lot of guys that selfishly or maybe unselfishly, they, they 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 don't have children or a family. They choose that lifestyle to be able to pursue the big fish sort of scene. Um, there's not many people that have got normal jobs and a family and that that go on to be like a nomadic mercenary that's chasing big fish. A bit like, I suppose, Terry Earns, the classic comparison. Because it's not a very normal thing to do.
for a person. And I was always torn between, I really wanted to do that, but I also, uh, I met uh, a, a girl when I was young and I wanted a normal family life and everything, you know, and I wanted children. I never thought I did, but I did. Once, once I'd matured a little bit and uh, I just, I don't think you can be a proper father and bring up children properly if you're an absent father and you're never there because you're fishing. And those kind of, you know, target fish fishing is a very selfish occupation in a lot of ways to be successful at it. You're going to have to devote a lot of time, be going every weekend if you're in a normal job. And how does that mix when you've got like young lads that want to play football and in football teams and they want the dad to take them to the football and all that. So I kind of sacrificed some of the, my aspirations and ambitions to have uh, a normal life as well as the fishing. Because the fishing is as important as it is. You know, I, I go fishing with my kids now. They're, they're old, you know, they're, they're adults now. They're uh, 20, 24 and 27. Uh, we're very close and to think if I'd have, I might have had a couple of albums or slide things full of all these monster fish, you know, everyone's doffing the cap to you and all that. Oh yeah, he's caught, Mary's caught this or he's caught, you know, single scale, blah, blah, blah. And then have no children and be a lonely old man. I know what I'd rather have. I'd rather have had the path I chose where I've got a family and... Uh, I've got all the, the rewarding bit there now. Uh, okay, I've not caught all these special t target fish that some people think is a, a badge of honour of how good you are as an angler, I suppose. But I'm not bothered about any of that. It's for other people to decide anyhow. And what does it matter? Does it matter if you're an average angler or you're an amazing angler? It doesn't matter to other people. I think what's mattered more with my fishing is that I've give quite a lot back to other people where there's things that I've come up with that they that's probably caught them fish. You know, whether it be floor hook baits or, you know, chod rigs or s stuff like that. So I think it's uh, the path of being the big fish angler that never was hasn't really bothered me. You know, I've caught some big ones. <laughs> Hey, I'd, for a northern, I've, I've had 15 English 40s. Uh, and I did keep records of the 30s I'd had at one time, English 30s. And it was 138. So that's not bad from a Manchester lad, you know. Uh, especially when I started, they want so many big fish around. So, yeah, but I mean, if we're talking about European fish, that's a different ball game, you know. It's, it's, few of them. So yeah. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, no matter how you dress it up, uh, English fish have that specialness to them, don't they? Because you... You know, especially where I live, you the few and far between. Because so, I've got, I've got a, a specialness about northern fish, if you like. I know it sounds a bit strange, that, but the most memorable fish to me are, are ones that have come from northern waters from where I live that are big. If they're big by the local standards there, they're very memorable, you know. So therefore, it, it follows that the, the bigger English fish that I've caught are, are giving me a great deal of pleasure. Uh, I mean, the, you know, big fish from anywhere are good, but the, the, there has that extra warmer glow from the, the, the English fish, yeah. I, I would be lying to say otherwise, uh, but there's not much in it. There's some, some of the ones I've had from Belgium and, uh, you know, some of the waters that are sparsely stocked with not many fish in. 
that have been incredible creatures and they, they've given me immense pleasure as well, you know. So, yeah, it all depends on the circumstances of the capture really as well. If you go on somewhere and you've caught, you know, it's full of big fish and you've caught loads of big ones on there, it's not quite as satisfying because it's sort of like not as special. I like the uniqueness. If it, if it happens infrequently, it's so much more rewarding and nice, isn't it? You know, you feel like you've deserved it more. Uh, yeah, I've got loads of regrets about things that I should have done. I think the main one is uh, I worked in advertising and uh, yeah, I was earning decent money and I, I got a mortgage and I realised that when I had the shop, I, I, I started making my own bait and selling more base mix than any other proprietary brand of bait in the in the shop because purely based on results it was successful uh, and then I started making the singles and I went working further down the line with Trevs of Wimslow and people were buying them uh, I made these things called fizzers that were autumn harvest and nouvelle fizz mixed together and I did uh, pineapple with embuteric and people were mail ordering them from all over the UK you know and I was making making tons of them I was literally selling it hand over fist and I never made my own bait commercially uh, ready rolled and I was at the cusp of whether to start my own bait company or not and do the singles the fluoros and I didn't for some stupid reason I just didn't do it I was scared of getting uh, trapped whereby I was self-employed. I was in a factory rolling bait instead of fishing. My, my angling instinct was so strong that I kind of knew a few people that had gone down the bait route themselves. Mick Ball was one of them. And he found that he was hardly doing any fishing because he was trapped in, in, the, in the situation where he had to be in rolling bait all the time. And I kind of knew that I was letting myself in for that. And instead of looking at the bigger picture, I, I was never a businessman. I did the easy option uh, years later, about 1998, I think Dynamite came to me and wanted to, to do the fluoros. Bear in mind, I'd been using them for nearly 20 years then. I let them do them and uh, Pete Chandler, the old sales director told me they did 1.1 million in pounds worth of sales in the first year. They lied at the time. They told me 600 grand because I was getting 10% of the uh, trade price. Still a lot of money. Bear in mind for all that time ago. So imagine if I would have done it myself and, and uh, sold home. I'd, I'd have had a, a huge business that could have probably made myself a very wealthy man and uh, that's a huge regret yeah of course it is I should have just been doing those specialized single hook baits from from the early 80s I can't even comprehend how how much money I could have made out of that but money's never been my driver so yeah I have regrets obviously but I've no regrets about the life I've had because I've had such a great angling life really and uh, amongst other things you know and other regrets, I suppose I wished I'd have uh, carried on fishing Savvy and Harefield because all I did was tip a, tip a toe in the water. I just went down on a day ticket just once in a blue moon rather than get in the syndicate and fish it properly. I mean, I could have got in the syndicate, but I just, you know, I suppose it was the journey and the, the lack of good good vehicles that put me off in the early 80s doing that but I often think I would have been uh, part of that journey you know I still know them all anyhow but I think it would have been very interesting as part of my fishing evolution but everything's meant to happen for a reason uh, I wish it had gone to redo to that time even if it had bankrupted me uh, yeah I've not got too many regrets I uh, 
I think there's a few waters of, that fall in that ilk that I never bothered with properly. Uh, Elsto being one, I didn't like it when they started banning a few things and I didn't like the click on there. Some of them are all right, but you know, I, I wasn't happy with some of the locals. They were, they were far from friendly. And I won't fish if there's an atmosphere. And uh, it was almost like, who do you think you are coming on our water? You know, I don't know whether they see me as a threat or, you know, they almost made out, oh, you're one of them guys that seeks publicity that's coming on here and we'll show you what real angling's about. A bit like, you know, oh, fuck off, who do you think you are? When I, I, I'm very easy going and friendly and everything and I, I've never actually felt I'm anything. I'm just a carp angler, you know. The fact that you write for magazines in the past or have done DVDs or anything doesn't mean that you think you're uh, anything special. It just means it was a vehicle to pass on information at the time, you know, uh, when there was very little information, that's all. So I've never actually thought I'm um, anything of, of an angler. That's for other people to decide, I think, not yourself. So, yeah, no, I've got no regrets, no. I think... Uh, Yeah, I guess one of them was leaving Corder as well, <laughs> ironically. I I got offered a share in a, a company in Europe, which never materialised actually, and quite a reasonable amount of money was thrown at me. And even though I liked Corder and I liked the products and everything, it was nice there, I had bills to pay, you know, so... I, I knew Corder was always going to go places because I was with Dan in the early days making the, the Corder first DVDs we did with Len Gerd. And, uh, you know, he always wanted me to move down south and work with him and stuff like that because we were good mates. And But at the time I'd got young children and I got offered, you know, the carrot was dangled. And I just, as a financial decision, I had to leave and uh, obviously we've all seen where they've gone on to be now, you know, and everyone involved with it sort of on, on the crest of a wave, really. And I, I often think, bloody hell, I could have been in a, in a much nicer place, really, if I'd have, you know, towed the line and stayed there. And that's a regret, really. Yeah, I do regret that. Uh, but, you know, it's... Uh, it was it was it was sad really because the company that uh, came and dangled the carrot and that went bankrupt. And they they never they never delivered what they what they promised, you know. So it was a double kick in the balls actually. Yeah, that's one regret. And uh, yeah, well, apart from that, not really, not really. I, oh, I, there is another one. I, I wish what I did with my kids is I let them. Uh, be normal children didn't force fishing on them i never never thought it was a smart thing to do because i think you if you want to be an angler it's in you naturally it's sort of not not something that you can be pushed into or else you you're never simply not going to enjoy it the same so my kids from an early age of course they come fishing with me and they i left them to it they all loved it but they also did their other things like the boys were very, very good footballers. Guy ended up playing for Bolton Wanderers in the academy and everything, my eldest son. Well, they were both excellent footballers. So I used to take them, become obsessed with it, you know, like you do, proud dad. Taking them to all the matches and uh, watched our guy score in his first full full game uh, in the Reebok against Wigan. He, he scored, the, they won 1-0 and he scored it. Come on after 20 minutes as a sub, so you're like, wow. So he was going to be a footballer, that was it, you know, a professional footballer. Uh, so fishing never got forced down his throat because I didn't want to cloud the water. But now he's gone mad on fishing and I kind of wish I'd have shown him the ins and outs of everything from being a, a tiny kid because he, he's already a very, very good angler and Jamie is, but he would have been a ridiculous angler. He's just got the knack. He's definitely got the knack. But I think he would have been so far down the road if I had been able to nurture him along with the same effort that he put into the football as the fishing. I reckon he, you know, he can nearly outcast me now and everything. He's a great caster and that. And uh, he's got his own way. I mean, I've got a radio control boat. 
I've never really bought into them. I've got one. And he says, oh, what are you using that for? He says, you cheating bastard, you know. He says, oh, I'm not. He said, they're cheating them. I'm not going to have one of them. He will not use a boat or anything. I use them occasionally, not all the time. Just for maggots and stuff like that, you know, stuff that's a mess. Or if you want to do a stealth approach, I'll use one, but he won't have none of it. You know, he's pretty old school, really, even though he's a new school, but he's old school sort of uh, ethics, which is nice in a way. And... Uh, which is ironic, funny enough, because he's give me shit saying I'm a dinosaur because I wouldn't use a bait boat. No, he's giving me the old, he's not using one. No, I've got one, which is fairly weird. But uh, I suppose they're contrary. But yeah, that's really great. I wish I'd have uh, pushed him along more because, you know, I can see some of these youngsters doing really quite well in angling and ended up in the, in the business. And I think... They could have easily have done it if I'd have pushed them along more and they would have learnt about, you know, all the camera work and making their own little films and stuff. A bit like Alex and whatever, the other the other young fellas that... Yeah, Alex and Carl. Uh, uh, you know, you see them doing well with all these followers on YouTube and that, and I think, bloody hell, it would have been nice to have seen my lot doing it as well, you know. Only, only as a long-time angler, but it can still come that, you know, and still do it, because they've, they've done bits. So, uh, yeah, watch this space. That's another uh, thing we're planning, but it could be uh, quite a long learning curve, I guess. Yeah, so I suppose that's it then, isn't it, really? Yeah. <laughs>